As everybody talks about Jerome Powell and what just happened in the press conference and raising rates and higher for longer, I think there's something that really got overlooked. And that particular case is this. Two-year treasury yield tops 5% for the first time since 2007. Now, I don't remember 2007, but we went this little, uh, the big recession, and that lasted for uh, about a couple of years or so. And when we take all these treasury yields, that is one of those recession indicators. So here's what's happening and why it's concerning me. So the two-year U.S. Treasury yield on Tuesday topped 5%, rose its highest level since 2007, as investors assessed comments from Federal Reserve Chairman Jay Powell, who said the central bank may need to increase the pace of interest rate hikes again. Now, everybody's talking about this on YouTube. I don't want to cover it, but essentially it just goes like this. Jerome Powell is saying, look, we got, we're got we not having everything under, uh, under control. Uh, inflation is, is still not tamed. We need to raise rates for longer and higher and essentially faster. That's essentially what he's going to say, and that's what he talked about today. And then that will affect these recession indicators, which is the yield. And it says here, meanwhile, the yield on the benchmark 10-year treasury was little changed at 3.97. Why is this important? Because we're talking about the 10 and two years. If we take a look at Y charts, there's a link in the description. It says very simply like this, a 10 and, 10, a 10 and two treasury spread that, appre- that approaches zero signifies a flattening yield curve. A negative 10 and two yield spread has historically been viewed as a precursor to a recessionary period. A negative 10 2 spread is predicted every single recession from 1955 to 2018, but has occurred six to 24 months before the recession occurring. And this actually started in 2022 of July. So, what it should look like as far as 10 and 2, if you just take a look at it, this is the Treasury yield curves. And you got it from one month, three months, six, one year. This is what it should look like because as time goes on, you know, you take a little bit more risk, right? Because over 30 years, you want to do that. And we'll give you 4.72% as far as the treasury yield, as far as what the government will pay. That's what it's supposed to look like over time. However, when these start to invert, like we have right now, now you got the six month treasury yield at 5.22. And what that means is like, look, we don't know what's gonna happen in the next six months. We'll give you 5%. Just give us some cash. We gotta bail ourselves out. And then over here, for the, for the, well, that's 30 year, 10 year, it's at 3.9%. That's not what it's supposed to look like. That is the precursor and that's what's going on. Now that does not mean that we are guaranteed a recession, but it is something to look out for. Well, how the markets get affected? Well, honestly, not too bad. I mean, only one and a half percent in the S&P 500. If we take a look and just zoom out, we're five days looking pretty good. One month, okay, got me on that one. Six month for a year, kind of sideways action, five years, <laughs> Not doing too bad, honestly. And then if we look at the uh, the NASDAQ, uh, you can see it over a day, down a little bit, right? If we take a look at over uh, six months, see how it's going, pretty much a little sideways action. And then if we take a look over three years, still looking pretty good. And uh, how do crypto react? I don't really care. Crypto doesn't really care. And last hour, Bitcoin's down 0.1% and nothing's really budged. So the thing you have to ask yourself is, is it priced in? And I can't say for sure, but this article does talk about some interesting things where they say here, some investors found the comments unsurprising from Jerome Powell. They said, look, while some market participants might have been caught off guard by Powell's comments, the reality is that he is largely affirming what the bond market has already priced in. Concerns about the pace of rate increase dragging the U.S. economy into a recession have spread among investors and prompted May to hope for the Fed to pause rate hikes this year. In recent weeks, Fed officials have hinted that rates could go higher still and remain elevated for longer. They haven't been hinting at it. They've been telling us what they're going to do. This is no surprise. And then lastly, I will just say this. As far as like uh, pausing rate hikes and essentially pivoting, that sounds great. But if we take a look at when the Fed pivots, and this is going back uh, quite some time, even back to the 1960s, you can say that uh, as far as the S&P 500, when the Fed pivots and they stop raising those rate hikes and they actually decrease, say, okay, we're not going to raise them, we're going to lower them, that's when the economy, or when the, excuse me, when the S&P 500 actually says, you know what, you guys broke something and now we start to fall apart. And this happened in 2000. This happened in 2007. This happened again in the 2000. Well, this was during the uh, pandemic. But what's interesting to note here, take a look at this upward momentum as it just goes this way and just keeps going up. S&P 500, if you lay that over the M2 money supply, 
Isn't it interesting? Oh, this is in red. And of course, they've they've changed the way that they calculate M2 money supply and where, but when we take a look at here, it just seems like, honestly, that uh, when there's more liquidity in the system, it seems like things do pretty well. As there's more money sloshing around to to lubricate the giant that is uh, the S&P 500, even, even right here, 2008 and nine, as uh, they pivoted. And of course, these two places, they pivot, it goes down, they go, whoa, we broke something. Let's start printing some more money. They do that here. And then same thing happens over here in 2008. And they, they pivot and like, wow, we broke something. Let's, let's print some more money. And of course, we're coming up over here. And now they've gone in the reverse, raising rates, stopping the printing and doing quantitative tightening. So who knows where we're going off in the future, but just remember that uh, bear markets don't last forever, neither do bull markets. And that'll lead me to uh, my last section here. I, uh, I had a, uh, a conversation with a couple of, uh, of retail investors at Celsius, and they wanted me to, uh, they said, hey, you should talk to uh, Deborah Kofsky. Uh, she is uh, working for us for the uh, Celsius and the uh, chapter 11 bankruptcy. And she represents the withhold and retail accounts group along with BlockFi. And I'll just uh, say this first that I apologize for the audio. I'm not for sure exactly what happened here, but uh, there's a little bit uh, of offness of the audio, but it doesn't matter because listen to this interview uh, with me and Deb, and you're gonna understand why this case that is coming before us for chapter 11 is going to dictate just as much as what's going on potentially with the SEC coming down on Ripple and all the other centralized exchanges. So just take a listen to what we have here. Let's just uh, bring in somebody that can give us a little revelation about uh, the things that are happening uh, as far as Celsius. Deb, welcome to the show for the first time. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, so we're in the intro. People know, uh, you know where you're from, what you're all about. But there's some questions that we had. And one of those things is I want to talk to you about, just do like a quick follow-up and an overview of the video that you and CTO did. It was about an hour or so, the link is in the description, you guys can check that out. And the things that we talked about, it made me realize that this is a bigger issue than more than people realize. Also, uh, talked to us about why the withhold group is a good chance of having all their funds returned. And then lastly, just real quick, explain to us about, there's a question about this 502D and how that impacts the bankruptcy. So first things first. This video, fantastic. I watched about two or three times you and a friend of the show, CTO Larson. And one of the things you talked about in the very beginning is you talked about how you said, look, stockbrokers, financial institutions, and banks are regulated and have insurance. This new sector of finance called crypto and digital assets. Uh, they don't have that. They have neither because regulators haven't caught up and put in laws or given guidance. How big of an issue is that in this situation? I think it's an enormous issue. And I think it's something that the SEC is going to need to start addressing, um, not just through you know, regulation by enforcement. I think that bank regulators, I think Congress, that somebody's going to have to figure out some kind of regime where if you are investing in something that looks like a bank, feels like a bank, or looks like a stock broker and feels like a stock broker and is kind of shaped like these financial institutions where if you put your assets on, you're protected in the event of an insolvency. Um, we need to see something similar or you're going to keep having these types of issues. And the end result is going to be there's not going to be any any possibility of, of a, a CFI crypto industry in the U.S. because people are going to say, look, you know, this is great. But if anything goes sideways, I'm going to lose everything. And you're going to try to claw it all back for me. So you know, the, the current regime just does not work and really needs to be addressed in a more organized fashion. Great. Could have said it better. All right. So the next, I'm not going to, I'm not going to harp on this one. People on the channel know my stance on that. And then you'd also talked about, even if you live outside the U S you are still susceptible to these 90 day clawbacks. Right. So, so I, I spoke with, with um, CTO Larson a little bit about this concept uh, of extraterritoriality, and I keep stumbling over that word. It's a lot of syllables. Uh, the, so there, there are multiple pieces here. Like one, can the statute be applied outside of the United States? And I think that the way that the Second Circuit has answered that question, and that's where New York courts are in the Second Circuit, um, is yes. 
Uh, so we've, we've got a statute where it doesn't matter where the defendant is, if the transfer being avoided is from a U.S. debtor, I think, I think we're in business there. Uh, but there are some other points to consider as well. Um, before a bankruptcy court can reach out and just you know, grab a defendant you know, halfway across the world and say, hey, I'm going to enter a judgment against you, there's got to be personal jurisdiction. There's a due process issue. Mm-hmm. That individual has to have at least minimum contacts with the United States. And one of the things you'd want to be looking at is, well, what do the terms of service say? If you're doing business with a crypto platform in the U.S. that is U.S.-based, and you click, you know, that 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 click wrap agreement when you go and you open your account and you're agreeing to the terms of use. What does it say about jurisdiction? What does it say you're consenting to? Because you can consent to the jurisdiction of the U.S. courts. So that's something to think about. And then the last issue is service. Well, so let's say there is personal jurisdiction over you because like maybe you agree to it in the terms of use. Then the trustee or the debtor, whoever's suing, has to figure out how to serve you properly in whatever country you're in. So is it more difficult and expensive? Sure. Is it doable? Absolutely. Yeah, it's doable. But then you also said something else about, look, if you if you withdrew your funds within 90 days and then you gambled it all away and then you could prove that you did that or you lost it in some way, shape or form, whatever you did, but you actually, actually had to prove it, what are the chances of them going after you for that? Well, they're not going to know <laughs> at, sure. at the outset what, what you've done with your assets or what your financial status is. But I don't think any lawyer that I know that's a, you know, a, 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 a responsible bankruptcy lawyer is in the business of trying to force defendants into bankruptcy themselves. If any any situation I've had where, you know, I've, and I've represented post-confirmation trustees suing defendants and they've come back and said, look, that's great, but you know what? My financial circumstances have changed. I just don't have the money. You can't get blood from a stone. And then at that point you say, okay, prove it. Show me your financials. Show me your bank account statements. Show me your list of assets. Give me an affidavit. And if you can really show that you're judgment proof, then, you know, I, I do understand you cannot actually get blood from a stone. And that's kind of, you know, where things end up. Now, if they show me they have no assets, but, you know, mysteriously their house somehow just transferred into their kid's name three weeks ago, that's a very different story. Sure. I mean, that, that, that totally makes sense, which I guess would lead me to the, the other thing you guys talked about as far as transfers. This is, the, this is the most scary. This is one of the reasons why I think we need some type of regulation. You take one Bitcoin and it goes from Celsius, you withdraw it within 90 days. Then you, you take that, that Bitcoin, put it into Voyager, take that out. Then you go to FTX, take that out. Within a 90 day time frame, how many Bitcoins do you owe? Potentially, each debtor could seek to claw back a Bitcoin from you. Um, because it's potentially a preferential transfer with defenses. And, and I, I think you're right. There needs to be some kind of, of regulatory scheme that would deal with this. This is just not a, a scenario the bankruptcy code ever contemplated. And honestly, I think at that point, all you can do is get all three, four, five, however many trustees are pursuing you, put them all in a room together, let them fight it out. Say, guys, I've got one Bitcoin. Y'all can decide who gets it. Well, speaking of the people that may or may not have that Bitcoin, there was another thing you guys talked about as far as uh, the retail or the individual versus the insiders. Mm-hmm. And it's not like to me that for the retail, us, we're gonna they're gonna be able to go back 90 days. But as far as like the insiders and what they could look at to to get back, you're looking at a year to two years, and they can look at the finances. I wasn't too clear on this one. Okay, so for preferences, the look back for non-insiders is 90 days. For insiders, it's a year. So there's a much longer time period that the trustee is going to be looking at, you know, Alex Mashinsky, Sam bakeman fried whoever, whoever the insiders are of each of these entities, um, they're going to be scrutinized for at least a year back. They're also going to be looked at very closely, I would imagine, for fraudulent transfers, which are you know, another type of clawback, and that can have a look back period uh, under state law, four to six years, depending on what state you're in. I gotcha. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. And then the last thing I think we, we talked about was because you you represent a lot of different individuals, uh, but non insiders, of course. And you you talked about it. You said, well, I don't usually go after non insiders because that's who you represent. But in most cases that you've seen, where is the the bulk of the funds coming from when they're trying to claw these these things back or preferences? Is it from non insiders or insiders? So I, I have been in cases where non-insider preferences have been pursued, and I represent a lot of committees and thus a lot of post-confirmation trustees, so I'm often the one analyzing preferences and making recommendations. 
um, in my experience, most of the time, the big dollars are the ones that went to the insiders because they were in a position to loot the company. Not always, um, but that that's usually it. The other thing that I always think about in the analysis that I always do is, look, I could go out and I could pursue a thousand preference claims against non-insiders, against general unsecured creditors. The only reason to pursue preference claim, the only possible justification is if I think that's going to result overall in a better return, a better recovery to the unsecured creditors as a whole. If I'm looking at this and I say, I can pursue these thousand preference claims, I'm going to make great attorney's fees on this and I'm going to be so excited. I'm going to buy a new car, whatever. But at the end of the day, I'm increasing the distribution to unsecured creditors by half a percent, one percent. That's not worth it. That, right. that, that to me, that's a breach of fiduciary duty. I, I got to agree with you. And like, there was a video that just put out that talked about how, and this is unsubstantiated so far, but it looks like Alex Vashinsky and upper management, there looks like they've gotten out 70 to 80 million over the last two years or so. So mm -hmm. maybe that's a good idea to look look there first. I'm just just saying. Okay. So so Deb, that was just that that overview part. Let's get into some couple of questions, which is this. Now you represent the withhold group. So mm -hmm. talk to us about why they have a really good chance of getting their, their funds returned. Well, I think they, they do have a good chance because withhold is basically like custody, but in those states where Celsius wasn't entitled to offer custody accounts. So you have the same issue where you have people who took their money out of earned, they were no longer lending their assets to Celsius. They were no longer granting Celsius rights of ownership. Celsius no longer had any contractual rights to do anything with those assets. Uh, unfortunately, didn't properly um, safeguard them, but there are definitely, um, I think, strong legal and equitable claims as to why withhold should be treated comparably to custody. Excellent. So hopefully they can get, hopefully they can get 100% back because it was a, not that it was a gray area, but I mean, this was kind of put on the fly. It was very fast. I didn't understand how they couldn't do other things, but I guess state by state regulations just wouldn't allow that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the last question is, there was a, this keeps coming up, this 502D and how this, this impacts the bankruptcy. Can you explain what that is? Sure. So what 502D of the bankruptcy code says is that basically if you owe a preference, if you received a preferential transfer from the debtor, so you got something out in the 90 days before and it's a preferential transfer potentially, um, until that gets resolved, until you either you know, are found not to owe it or you pay it back, you're not entitled to any distribution from the estate. So let's say you still got you know, $100,000 still locked up. Well, that might be in the range of releases. Let's say you have half a million dollars still locked up on a platform um, and, and you'd like to get your distribution out because all of the other creditors, they're getting their 20 cents, 30 cents, 60 cents, whatever they're getting as their distribution. And you're like, well, where's mine? I'm waiting you know, to get my transfer of, of Bitcoin or cash or whatever I'm going to get. And the, and the trustee or the debtor, whoever is, in charge of actually administering the plan is going to say, I'm sorry, I can't distribute to you because you've received this potential preference. And so until we get that resolved, I'm hanging on to all of these assets because the bankruptcy code says I can. Okay. Yeah. It's going to put people in a little bit of a limbo, I think, from there. Mm -hmm. All right. And then, Deb, the last one, this will be the bonus question, which is okay. this. We had talked about this before. I didn't really understand it that well. Cram downs. Mm -hmm. Explain mm -hmm. to us about cram down so I can understand it best. Okay. All right. And this is a complicated topic and it's one that I wish I like, had a whiteboard here. It would be a lot easier. Um, a lot of people think that if the creditors of, of a debtor as a whole reject the debtor's plan, that plan doesn't get confirmed, it fails. That is not necessarily true because creditors don't vote in a single block. Creditors are classified into different classes. So okay. you may have um, let's say, a class of convenience creditors who are small creditors, maybe there's a lot of them, their total dollar value is, let's call it $100 million. And let's say there's 10,000 creditors in that class and they're owed $100 million. And then you've got maybe another $10,000 of credit, or sorry, another 10,000 creditors in, in a separate class, but they're owed a billion dollars, right? Mm -hmm. So you think one class is much bigger. And if that class voted to reject the plan because they're owed so much more money, that would just tank the plan. But that's not how cram down works because all that you need in order to confirm a bankruptcy plan is one impaired class that votes to accept the plan. 
So if the little class that's only owed $100 million votes to accept the plan and a class accepts a plan by voting in favor of the plan by more than half the members in the class that are holding more than two thirds of the, of the dollar value. So mm -hmm. you've got your, your one class over here that's the little class that's only owed $100 million, and they vote in favor of the plan as a class. Not everybody in the class has to vote in favor, but right. enough vote in favor holding enough claims that that class says thumbs up. Then you've got the big class that's owed a billion dollars and they say, forget it. We think this plan sucks. We vote against it. And they think, great, we're, we're going to tank this plan. This is not going to go forward. As long as the other requirements of the bankruptcy code are met, that plan can still be confirmed. It can be crammed down over the objections of the dissenting class, over their rejection of the plan. Even though if you look at it on, you know, on a dollar basis, they hold the vast majority of claims against the debtor. Uh, but that's the way that the bankruptcy court is structured. Now, there are arguments about, well, did you improperly gerrymander the classes just so you could get an impaired accepting class? And, and those are things that get litigated all the time. But um, that, that's, that's the idea of cram down. You cannot assume that just because, even if it's a, a majority in number and a majority in claim amount that votes to reject the plan, it can still get confirmed as long as there's an impaired accepting class and the other requirements of the bankruptcy code are met. Hey, well, Deb, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. Because I don't think I could do those types of things and deal with those situations. So everybody, first of all, Deb, thanks for stopping by. We appreciate Absolutely. it. Thank yeah. you so and, much for having me. Yes, and what I'll do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna put your information up. If you are a part of any of these, these groups or these classes and you'd like to reach out and talk to Deb and uh, her law firm, uh, the information will be there, links in the description, and that is it for this one. So Deb, thanks so much. Thanks. Take care. All right. So that's it. So again, you can find uh, uh, Deb uh, Kofsky's uh, information in the link in the description if you need to reach out and contact her. But that is it for today. So look, like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. But that's it for today. Uh, thanks so much for stopping by. I appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next one.